Okay, welcome back to my GCSE Poetry Seen and Unseen unit um, for my students at Langdon Park School. Uh, this is lesson number nine. We're going to look at the great Seamus Heaney. We're going to look at two of his poems. And uh, Seamus Heaney died uh, not very long ago. Um, uh, remarkable uh, poet from uh, Ireland. Um, really has a very specific relationship to nature and it, we're going to look at that and we're going to think about that and think about our own relationship to nature and think maybe about how his relationship to nature is similar or different to the relationship of people like Wordsworth and Shelley or if you're really pushing it even even Blake is is nature something we're in harmony with is nature and something we're in conflict with? And remember, the the studied unit of poems are the are, are power and conflict, um, or is is it something we are we are one of? To say we're separate from it is an illusion. Let's let's take a look. Okay, so here's a starter. Of course, if you had time, um, you could discuss the these images. But I want you to just look at them and press pause and answer, what's the difference between living in the city and living in the countryside? This is particularly interesting right now during the coronavirus lockdown, but it is worth thinking about generally, and what for you could be seen as the advantages and disadvantages of both. Okay, pause now, look at the images, write something down. Okay, so right now I miss the sound and smells and all sorts of the sights in the city very much. I am not a nature person and I, one of the weirdest things about what's going on right now is I've sort of started to have a fondness for trees and birds and their noises and the emptiness. Um, while being lonely, I can see that there is a kind of beauty to that. But I suspect I feel that way because I'm in the city and I, I love cities and I love everything about them from the cement to the people to, uh, you know, just simply everything. Um, but let's dig a little bit deeper into this notion and think about nature and its relationship to us. Is nature something, if you could look at these four images, again, pause after I'm done speaking, um, is nature something that is helpful or harmful to humans? Um, is, it, is it destructive? Or is our human and nature actually, you can't, you can't say there's a separate, we are part of nature. We, there is no destruction or benefit. We are, we are living symbiotically together. What in your opinion is it? So if you could just pause here and just write down in your opinion, humans and nature. Are we in conflict? Or uh, does nature serve us? Or are we, there's no such thing as a division between us and nature. Okay, so these are some of the ideas and themes that you're going to see in the poetry of Seamus Heaney. Um, as discussed, we're going to look at his response to the natural world in these two poems. And then we're going to, this is one of those lessons where there's a writing frame for which I'd like you to transform the second poem into a piece of creative writing. Um, and we give you a, uh, an exemplar of how to do that. Um, okay, so let's start with another pair of images. Um, if you could just look at them. It's a bit abstract, so I need you to kind of just go with it. If you could pause and think about what links these images, which of these two people are working harder and why? Um, which one loves their work more and why? Okay, these are abstract questions. I don't know how uh, we could respond directly, but it seems to me that the shovel in the image on the left echoes or mirrors the pen on the right. Um, they're both going into something. Um, the shovel is pulling up dirt, whereas the pencil is placing things on the page. Uh, I think it's tempting to say always that the person who's physically exerting themselves is working harder. But what harder is means is something to think about. Um, is it pain? Is it uh, strenuousness? Is it a feeling of not knowing what you're doing? Because I think sometimes when you're writing, you have no idea, and it can it can provide you with a very different and separate form of pain. Um, 
it's impossible to say who loves their work more, but I can say that both love it. Both can love what they do, and both are valuable and virtuous work to be done in the world. There's not one is not better than the other. But it is interesting to me that how both are angled down and that one is unearthing things in the ground and while one is putting things on the page, they might be uncovering or digging or pulling things up in another way. Those are just some of the ideas. Well, the the poem is called Digging and it links these two things. Um before I read the poem, could you just read these again? Could you pause? Could you read these fragments and predict how these images will be linked in this poem? And further, when we're reading the poem, what I really like you to do is think about different senses every time we reread it. So I'm going to read the poem first, actually, right now. Um, you can follow along. It's on page 39. Um, okay, so sorry, you should pause right now and just make some predictions based on these fragments of lines. Okay, you've paused, you've made some predictions. Now I'd like you to have read the poem at least once on your own and pick a sense to focus on, pick, pick sound. Um, now when I read it, I'm going to try and read it without a pen um, to just get a sense of uh, maybe smell or sight or just to see to see the feelings, the, the senses that he evokes in this fantastic poem, Digging. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. Under my window, a clean, rasping sound, when the spade sinks into gravelly ground, my father digging. I look down, till his sta straining rump among the flower beds bends low, comes up twenty years away, stooping in rhythm through potato drills where he was digging. The coarse boot nestled on the lug, the shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly. He rooted out tall tops, buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. By God, the old man could handle a spade, just like his old man. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Tonner's bog. Once I carried him milk in a bottle cork sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to, and then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving sods over his shoulder, going down and down for the good turf, digging. The cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the cut, the curt cuts of an edge through living roots awaken in my head, but I've no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. That's pretty, um, I remember reading that poem for the first time many years ago and I was bl blowed away because I, I felt like I actually experienced something. I mean, you've read the poem hopefully once on your own. That's me reading it the second time. I'm going to read it again and um, annotate it. And I want you to think about how you would annotate it on your own because you've done this enough now that you should be able to at least make an attempt. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to annotate things I like, sensory details. I want to pick, even if it feels arbitrary, I want to pick different moments where I can split the poem into parts. Okay, so let's see. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. I mean, the pen and a gun, comfortable. What's he going to do? something violent. I don't think so, but it is a strange kind of way to articulate that opening. Under my window, a clean rasping sound when the spade sinks into gravelly ground. This sharp sounds contrast with softness of the ground, earth later, my father digging. I look down till his straining rump. That's pain, that hunched over. 
That's a bit vulgar. That's his, his, his behind. Among the flower bed bends low. Comes up 20 years away. What's happened there? Is that time? Is it memory? Stooping in rhythm through potato drills where he was digging. I don't know what's happened there. A hiccup, maybe. Something, something. Something's occurred. I'm going to put a dotted line because I'm not sure, but that's, I feel like there's a shift here. The coarse boot nestled on the lug. The shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly. I, these, like, I, I feel, I can see the movement of the shovel. And I don't know what is doing it. I think it's the lev levered firmly, the boot. All that he rooted and you know see look how subtle those sounds he gives this this harmony to this activity he rooted out tall tops buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked loving their cool hardness in our hands that is brilliant I can feel that sensual touch and that joy, that, that power, he really captures it. By God, the old man could handle a spade. Just like his old man. So now, more memory. Family. Past. So I'm going to commit. I think that's a, a Volta. This is now a new one. We go back in time now. My, my grandfather cut more turf in a day than any, any other man on Tonner's bog. I don't know what these are or where that is, but it sounds specific and good and strong. Oh, here's another amazing sensual detail. Once I carried him milk in a bottle corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it and then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly. Do you see? I can see the man sense his purpose the little boy the detail of you know putting a stopper in it so the milk doesn't spill out i just find it so simple and so so great and then that juxtaposition of the milk that softness and the straightening up and the nicking and the slicing heaving over his shoulder because he's doing something he's digging work farming uncovering digging could be concealing never thought about that the cold smell of potato mold oh what is that i am not a fan of nature i do not like being in the country but that is something for me uh, the squelch and slap of soggy peat. Give it to me. I am here. I'm feeling it. Uh, cut, curt cuts of an edge through living roots awaken in my head. So here we get the key link. The activity of touch and feel links the living root, the living thing of, of farming, Tut gets into him. But he recognizes he know, he's no farmer because he doesn't have a spade. It gets into his head because he is a writer, but he's going to dig as well. But he's going to dig his memory. The squat pen's there, and I'll dig with it. I, I've, got, I've got a pen. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to do what my dad did. I'm going to do what my, father, my grandfather did. And I'm going to be a really careful, precise, hardworking person who experiences and delivers to the world something that matters. And you're going to feel it in your hands. You're going to smell it uh, just like they did. And you're going to be able to see it and experience it. I think this is an ambitious poem. It's really powerful. I, I really enjoy reading it. And let me emphasize that I really dislike nature. That's how much I like this poem. So now that you've read the poem a few times, uh, the language I think really resonates is that sensual detail.
detail. Um, we've, we've, I've tried to give you some of the turns in Volta. Maybe you agree with me. Maybe you have your own. Um, I'd want you to at least be able to split the poem into three um, to be able to start to write about it. Now, what I'd like you to do is look at these questions. I'd like you to pause the video and then write for five to seven minutes and just journal response. How is Heaney recreating the image of his father and grandfather digging? How does he show his admiration for his father and his grandfather? What does it say about himself? What's he saying about his own relationship with the place he grew up in, the place where he is, the earth itself? Okay, if you could press pause and do that now. I've given you some of my ideas. You should pick lines and take your own ideas. Great. Okay, so you've read the poem. You've read it a few times. You've read it with me now. You've annotated it. And now you've had a personal response, a journal, which is so crucial. You have to be doing every step of these exercises to be able to become a better reader and writer on poetry. And maybe, who knows, a poet yourself. So just to end that, um, if you just look at these two images, um, what were the expectations, do you think, on the speaker here? Um, and what are some of the challenges he faces in trying to do a life like this? And what does he feel about the place where he grew up? Um, just from the poem that you've read, what do you think about the, that you could say about that? If you could just pause and just sum up there. Okay, we're going to look at now another one of his poems. Uh, this is the one on the AQA spec, conflict uh, in the conflict cluster, storm on the island. I have another video I can attach to this. Um, it's, it's a little poem here. Um, you'll read some things on the internet that say this is really a poem about uh, Northern Irish politics. Uh, much of that rests on um, the idea that there's nothing actually to be frightened of. And Storm on the Island sounds like Stormont. Um, I'm really unconvinced by that reading, but if that is a reading that appeals to you. Maybe there is something going on in the poem that I'm not noticing. What I do know is this is a dramatic monologue and that this is a poem where um, it, it isn't violence. It's nature that is seemingly the enemy. Maybe think of exposure, think of, sh uh, think of uh, the prelude, think of Ozymandias. And, but in the end, the speaker realizes something where... The, maybe there's nothing really to be afraid of. So let me read the poem once, and then I'll do it one more time, um, annotating it. We are prepared. We build our houses squat, sink walls in rock, and roof them with good slate. This wizened earth has never troubled us with hay. So, as you see, there are no stacks or stooks that can be lost, nor are there trees which might prove company when it blows full blast. You know what I mean. Leaves and branches can raise a tragic chorus in a gale so that you can listen to the thing you fear, forgetting that it pummels your house too. But there are no trees, no natural shelter. You might think that the sea is company, exploding comfortably down the cliffs, but no. When it begins, the f flung spray hits the very window, spits like a tame cat turns savage. We just sit tight while wind dives and strafes invisibly. Space is a salvo. We are bombarded by the empty air. Strange. It is a huge nothing that we fear. So, we are prepared. They ready themselves. Um, they build their houses squat, small, sunk in the roof, with, uh, sunk in rock, and roof them with good slate. The wizened, the ancient, the old earth, has never troubled us with hay. So as you see, there are no stacks or stooks that can be lost. So this is tricky. Um, there's a kind of sarcasm here. This is a harsh place. <clears throat> they don't have hay. They don't have any protection. So they, they can't lose anything, seemingly. Um, there's nothing also that can prove company. When it blows full blast. You know what I mean. This is a harsh place. 
So there's nothing, there's, uh, you know, sometimes leaves and branches can, uh, ah, can make music. So you don't, so you don't feel alone. So it gives you company. So you feel like you have company. Oh, is that what this poem is? Okay. So that you can listen to the... This is a nice one. Listen to the thing you fear. Forgetting that it's... Okay. So listen to it destroying your home. But... Oh, that's funny. That's the first time I've noticed that. But there are no trees. So it's silent. There's no natural shelter. Nature doesn't protect. Okay, well, at least you have the sea, right? The sea. But you're wrong. You know, maybe you think the sea explodes comfortably down on the cliffs. No. I see these breaks anyway. So, set up. It's harsh. Okay, the sounds. No, no, no. The sea's no help either. Because the flung spray hits the very windows. And this is what it does. Really wild image. Wild simile. Something intimate and domestic turned violent enemy. The thing you love, tame, turns savage. All we can do is sit tight. This is conversational. It's like a person's talking. Wait. While wind dives and strafes invisibly. You can't see it. It's it, the, the air is a salvo. It's attacking. Unseen. Unheard. Which I never caught before. Attack. We are bombarded by empty air. Invisible. Empty. Nothing. It's weird. It's, it's weird because nothing... We're afraid of nothing. Nothing is what we're afraid of. Oh, what to make of that? I don't know. Uh, is is our fear imaginary? Is nature what we are? Is there no division? Oh, wow, I don't know. Um, it's a it's a fantastic poem, and look at that. I've been reading it for so long, and I just found something new in it. How does the writer show confidence at the beginning? Where does the tone shift to uncertainty? The C is what I'm particularly interested in. And the tone at the end of the poem. There's a bunch of key lines here. If you could just take a moment to annotate and read the poem again for yourself to think about. And I'm going to take you to the creative task now. Okay. So, oh, sorry, the journal task first. So we, what we always do is we try and respond to a poem uh, in journal writing, which is what you did for digging. Now, if you could just pause, pick some key lines that you think are important and um, some ideas and some themes and hopefully some evidence and just respond. If you could press pause and take five to seven minutes and really take that time to just explore what what does nature as a as a adversary look like in this poem? You could think about comparing it to other poems. It's worth thinking about the voice here, whatever you wish. So press pause. Okay, so now you have read a few of Heaney's poems. You've responded to them. You've annotated them. Now we'd like you to do a creative piece of writing, which is to think about um, turning this into a journal entry from someone who gets these storms regularly. And here is our example. Uh, we are prepared, or at least I always think we are. Our houses are sturdy and squat, and we are careful not to leave anything out that might be blown away. 
I always feel prepared until the storm hits. That feeling evaporates as the gale starts to blow full blast, rattling the windows and pummeling the house until it feels like the walls will break apart. We sit cowering in the living room, no sound to listen to but the howling air, no sound of leaves or branches clattering against the glass. There are no trees to protect the houses from the racing wind. The window panes shake as droplets of water lash against them. Down below the houses, the sea explodes against the rocks, sending sharp slices of water flying into the swirling air. I always worry the windows will crack as the spray catches against them, <coughs> spitting like a tame cat turns savage. We sit and wait and listen to the harsh roar of the empty air as the wind dives and strafes invisibly. The next day, I always think it's strange that we fear something we can't even see. So, if you could take the key lines of the poem, uh, use the imagery, the harsh weather, uh, and then the confidence turning into fear and a sense of isolation, if you could capture those in prose, you will have successfully transformed the poem into a piece of prose. You could go further, you can go on a bigger journey, you can take the voice further, but this is what we're looking for, that recreation of the poem into a piece of prose. Because that's what, it, that's, that's what these, these lessons are trying to get you to do, is think about reading in a creative way to take, to take the poems and transform them into literary products so that when we get to the analysis, you have a deeper understanding. Okay, so the plenary today, uh, I want you to think about how does Shaney show conflict with nature in similar and different ways to Wordsworth or Shelley. Um, if you could go back to those poems and think about how is nature uh, something that the speaker is in conflict with. Um, okay, so I hope that, that those two poems appeal to you. They re I really like them. Um, they definitely pay rereading. You should spend some time in them. Um, if you're like me and dislike nature or have no relationship with nature is probably a better way of saying it. Um, it's, it's a way of experiencing it. And I think it's all the more uh, poignant that uh, I can experience and enjoy them in the work of Seamus Heaney um, and not have to sneeze and scratch a lot. Anyway, I hope you're all doing well and I hope you're making your way through these lessons and I will talk to you soon.